This is the third presentation of Australia's September 2020 World Church Affirmation Sabbath event. The title of this third presentation being God's People Delivered. I wanted to begin this presentation by getting into that reason that I said I would elaborate on that was in regards to why God had to get his people to a point of having attained character perfection prior to the close of probation and Jacob's time of trouble. That reason that related to God's sanctuary system and the atonement process. So the reason is uh, because in order for God's people to receive forgiveness of sins, uh, Christ, uh, Christ's heavenly, uh, you know, Christ's high priest ministry in the heavenly tabernacle is necessary for that. So it's not possible for people to have their sins forgiven without Christ's uh, work of priestly intercession and ministration for his people. And there is going to come a time when he's no longer doing that. Christ isn't going to be uh, interceding, performing that priestly work of intercession for his people forever. Uh, for example, when his people are in heaven and when they are sinless, there's going to be no need for Christ to be uh, performing that work. Um, so the question is, when does Christ cease from performing this work of interceding for his people as high priest and performing that kind of ministry for them? Is it before the second coming of Christ or is it after the second coming of Christ? I propose that it is before the second advent of Christ. And the way I know this is the case is because according to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 16, when Christ returns for the second time at the second advent, um, when he returns, he will be returning wearing his kingly vesture, according to that verse. And Christ, uh, coming at his second coming, um, wearing his kingly vesture entails the fact that he has taken off his priestly garments in order to put on uh, that kingly vesture. And Christ taking off his priestly garments entails the fact that, he, that his work of, of priestly intercession has been brought to an end. Uh, and that would mean that forgiveness of sins is no longer possible after he does that. Now, a lot of people like to explain away this reality of God's people not sinning during Jacob's time of trouble and after the close probation by the explanation that God will forgive their sins in advance, which is an idea that is neither biblical nor supported by the spirit of prophecy. And it also uh, is an idea that's not really consistent with logic either. It's an idea that doesn't really make sense. And I'll explain why that is so. So a component of a person's forgiveness of sins is the removal of um, the imputation of sin from that person and the transference of that sin uh, to the heavenly tabernacle. How is it possible for a sin to be uh, removed from a person uh, if that's before that sin even exists to be removed from that person? How can the sin be imputed or accredited to that person before that sin has even been committed by that person in order to be imputed or accredited to them? How can the sin be transferred uh, from them into the heavenly tabernacle before that sin even exists to be removed from them and transferred into the heavenly tabernacle? Doesn't make sense, does it? But it gets worse. 
how can God uh, remove those sins that are that have been transferred into the heavenly tabernacle uh, from the heavenly tabernacle? How can he remove those sins from the heavenly tabernacle or blotted out, in other words, for them to be transferred onto Satan, the anti-typical scapegoat or anti-typical Azazel goat, before those sins even exist to be removed from the heavenly tabernacle to be placed onto Satan. It just does not make sense, does it? So there's some inconsistencies with logic, um, with you know these kinds of ideas that uh, people are trying to propagate. Our, under, our Adventist understanding of the sanctuary, which is biblical, is according to the book of Hebrews, the law, referring to the old covenant law, is a shadow, right? It, it, it points to things in the future. And it's a, it's a type of things. It's symbolic of things. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if that is the case, and then what we read about in Leviticus chapter 16, which is a typification uh uh, the description of the typification of the Day of Atonement. Um, uh, in in that uh, typification, you see that the sins are transferred onto Satan before the priest would take off his priestly garments. Therefore, Christ is going to be putting the sins onto Satan before he uh, takes off. Uh, but yeah, before he takes off his his priestly garments to put on his kingly vesture. Um, so. Uh, our, un our understanding as Adventists on this topic is is biblical, but um, my my point is our our biblical and Adventist understanding of the sanctuary um, of the anti-typical sanctuary of the heavenly tabernacle um, and the and God's atonement process. Um, our understanding of that necessitates the fact that. God's people will not be sinning during Jacob's time of trouble and after the close of probation in harmony with Revelation chapter 22 verse 11. Now I would like to get into uh, reading some Ellen White quotations, uh, most of which at least um, describe events that take place during this span of time uh, starting from the close of human probation and the moment of uh, God's people entering into the heavenly Canaan. And before I get into these particular ones, I think it will be helpful for us to be mindful of uh, what we find in early writings, uh, page 56, Point two, as well as page 56.3 as it's some practical things to know in regards to uh, living life during Jacob's time of trouble and then I'll, I'll get into those quotations that I said I would read. So these uh, paragraphs say the Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and He will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time, and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us, as he did to feed Elijah or rain manna from heaven, as he did for the Israelites. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble, for they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance 
before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. And now for those other quotations that I mentioned and before I read that I just want to mention that um, uh, Christ's uh, work of uh, intercession as high priest, um, that priestly work, that's the thing that's holding back the seven last plagues from being poured out and that's what we're going to see in uh, what I'm reading now, uh, which is going to be the chapter of early writings titled The Third Message Closed, which begins at page 279.1. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished their work and were prepared for the trying hour before them. They had received the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and the living testimony had been revived. The last great warning had sounded everywhere, and it had stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth who would not receive the message. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done. Then the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. And all the angelic host laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration, he that, it is, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case had been decided for life or death while Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary. The judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. The marriage of the Lamb was consummated. And the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus and the heirs of salvation. And Jesus was to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. As Jesus moved out of the most holy place, I heard the tinkling of the bells up upon his garment. And as he left, a cloud of darkness covered the inhabitants of the earth. There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. While Jesus had been standing between God and guilty man, a restraint was upon the people. But when he stepped out from between man and the Father, the restraint was removed, and Satan had entire control of the finally impenitent. It was impossible for the plagues to, to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. But as his work there was, is finished and his intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God, and it breaks with fury upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner, who has slighted salvation and hated reproof. In that fearful time after the close of Jesus' uh, mediation, the saints were living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Every case was decided, every jewel numbered. Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and the sins which had been confessed while he was in the most holy place were placed onto Satan, the originator of sin, who must suffer their punishment. Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown. Surrounded by the angelic host, he left heaven. The plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth. Some were denouncing God and cursing him. Others rushed to the people of God and begged to be taught how they might escape his judgments. But the saints had nothing for them. 
the last tear for sinners had been shed, the last agonizing prayer offered, the last burden borne, the last warning given, the sweet voice of mercy was no more to invite them. When the saints and all heaven were interested for their salvation, they had no interest for themselves. Life and death had been set before them. Many desired life, but made no effort to obtain it. They did not choose life. And now there was no atoning blood to cleanse the guilty, no, no compassionate saviour to plead with them, and cry, Spare, spare the sinner a little longer. All heaven had united with Jesus as they heard the fearful words, It is done, it is finished. The plan of salvation had been accomplished, but few had chosen to accept it. And as mercy's sweet voice died away, fear and horror seized the wicked with terrible distinctness. They heard the words, too late, too late. Those who had not prized God's word were hurrying to and fro, wandering from sea to sea, and from the north to the east, seek to seek the word of the Lord. Said the angel, they shall not find it. There is a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. What would they not give for one word of approval from God? But no, they must suffer hunger and thirst on. Day after day they slighted salvation prizing earthly riches and earthly pleasure higher than any heavenly pleasure or inducement. They have rejected Jesus and despised his saints. The filthy must remain filthy forever. Many of the wicked were greatly enraged as they suffered the effects of the plagues. It was a scene of fearful agony. Parents were bitterly reproaching their children and, their, and children their parents, brothers their sisters, and sisters their brothers. Loud wailing cries were heard in every direction. It was you who kept me from receiving the truth which would have saved me from this awful hour. The people turned upon their ministers with bitter hate and reproached them, saying, You have not warned us. You told us that all the world was to be converted and cried, Peace, peace, to quiet every fear that was aroused. You have not told us of this hour, and those who warned us of it you declared to be fanatics and evil men who would ruin us. But I saw that the ministers did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than that of their people. I would now like to read the first paragraph of the chapter in early writings um, titled The Time of Trouble, just the first paragraph. It says here, I saw the saints leaving the cities and villages and associating together in companies and living in the most solitary places. Angels provided them food and water while the wicked were suffering from hunger and thirst. Then I saw the leading men of the earth consulting together and Satan and his angels busy around them. I saw a writing copies of which were scattered in different parts of the land, giving orders that unless the saints should yield their particular faith, give up the Sabbath and observe the first day of the week, the people were at liberty, after a certain time, to put them to death. But in this hour of trial, the saints were calm and composed, trusting in God and leaning upon his promise that a way of escape would be made for them in some places. Sorry, in some places before the time the sorry, in some places before the time for the decree to be executed, the wicked rushed upon the saints to slay them, but angels in the form of men of war fought for them. Satan wished to have the uh, privilege of destroying the saints of the most high, but Jesus bade his angels watch over them. God would be honored by making a covenant with those who had kept his law in the sight of the heathen round about them, and Jesus would be honored by translating without their seeing death. 
the faithful waiting ones who had so long expected him. This next quotation comes from the Great Controversy, page 624.2, and that previous paragraph uh, was page number early writings 282.2. So here comes GC 624.2. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. Revelation 1, 13-15 is there referenced. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air, Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them, as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Saviour uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitude from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries, saying, This is the great power of God. Acts 8.10 is then referenced. Next quotation is Great Controversy, page 635.2. The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forests and the mountains, still plead for divine protection. While in every quarter, companies of armed men urged on, urged on by hosts of evil angels are preparing for the work of death. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of his chosen. Saith the Lord, ye shall have a song as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lighting down of his arm, with the indignation of his anger, and with the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest and hailstones. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 29 and verse 30 is there referenced. The next quotation I'll, I'll read from is Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 353.4. I saw that God will in a wonderful manner preserve his people through the time of trouble. As Jesus poured out his soul in agony in the garden, they will earnestly cry and agonize day and night for deliverance. The decree will go forth that they must disregard the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and honor the first day or lose their lives, but they will not yield and trample under, the, under their feet the Sabbath of the Lord, and honour an institution of papacy. Satan's host and wicked men will surround them, and exult over them, because there will seem to be no way of escape for them. But in the midst of their reverie and triumph, there is heard peal upon peal of the loudest thunder. The heavens have gathered blackness, and are only illuminated by the blazing light and terrible glory from heaven. 
as God utters his voice from his holy habitation. The next two paragraphs I'll read from uh, come from the Great Controversy, page 636.2 and page 636.3. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears shining in its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come upon and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heaven is one clear space of indescribable glory whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters saying it is done Revelation 16 17 is there referenced that voice shakes the heavens and the earth there is a mighty earthquake such as not uh, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great verse 17 and 18 the firmament the firmament appears to open and shut the glory from the throne of God seems flashing through the mountains shake like a reed in the wind and ragged rocks are scattered on every side there is a roar as a coming tempest the sea is lashed into fury there is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction the whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea its surface is breaking up its very foundations seem to be giving way mountain chains are sinking inhabited islands disappear the seaports that have become like sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters babylon the great has come in remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath great hailstones every one about the weight of a talent are doing their work of destruction verses 19 and 21 are there referenced the proudest cities of the earth are laid low the lordly palaces upon which the world's great men have lavished their wealth in order to glorify themselves are crumbling to ruin before them prison walls are rent asunder and god's people who have been held in bondage for their faith are set free next quotation is from great controversy page 640.2 the voice of god is heard from heaven declaring the day and hour of jesus's coming and deliverance and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people like peals of loudest thunder his words roll through the earth the israel of god stand listening with their eyes fixed upward their countenances are lighted up with his glory and shine as did the the face of moses when he came down from sinai the wicked cannot look upon them and when the blessing is pronounced on those who have honored god by keeping his sabbath holy there is a mighty shout of victory uh, this next quotation comes from the book initialed CET, uh, page 58.2. The 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. On their foreheads was written, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently to up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison when we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the lord and they would fall helpless to the ground then it was that the synagogue of satan knew that god had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss and they worshipped at our feet following quotation comes from early writings page 124.1 i saw that the priests who are leading on their flock to death are soon to be arrested in their dreadful career the plagues of god are coming but it will not be sufficient for the false shepherds to be tormented with one or two of these plagues 
God's hand at that time will be stretched out still in wrath and justice and will not be brought to himself again until his purposes are fully accomplished and the hireling priests are led to worship at the feet of the saints and to acknowledge that God has loved them because they held fast the truth and kept God's commandments and until all the unrighteous ones are destroyed from the earth. This following quotation will come from uh, the book of the, the devotional Maranatha, uh, page 287.7 to 287.8. A glorious light shone upon them, the saints. How beautiful they then looked. All marks of care and weariness were gone, and health and beauty were seen in every countenance. Their enemies, the heathen around them, fell like dead men. They could not endure the light that shone upon the delivered holy ones. This light and glory remained upon them until Jesus was seen in the clouds of heaven. And I saw a flaming cloud come where Jesus stood. Then Jesus took his place on the cloud which carried him to the east where it first appeared to the saints on earth. A small black cloud, which was the sign of the Son of Man, while the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the at the saints' feet. Next quotation comes from Great Controversy, page 647.3. As the ransomed ones are welcomed into, sorry, as the ransomed ones are welcomed to the city of God, there rings out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration. The two Adams are about to meet. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race, the being whom he created, who sinned against his Maker, and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are borne upon the Saviour's form. As Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon what sorry, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Tenderly the Saviour lifts him up and bids him look once more upon the Eden home from which he has so long been exiled. After his expulsion from Eden, Adam's life on earth was filled with sorrow. Every dying leaf, every victim of sacrifice, every blight upon the fair face of nature, every stain upon man's purity was a fresh reminder of his sin. Terrible was the agony of remorse, of remorse as he beheld iniquity abounding, and, in answer to his warnings, met the reproaches cast upon himself as the cause of sin. With patient, humiliation, with, with patient humility he bore, for nearly a thousand years, the penalty of transgression. Faithfully did he repent of his sin and trust in the merits of the promised Saviour, and he died in the hope of a resurrection. The Son of God redeemed man's failure and fall, and now through the work of the Atonement, Adam is reinstated in his first dominion. This next quotation comes from Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 950.7. The sacrifice of our Saviour has made ample position for every repenting, believing soul. We are saved because God loves the purchase of the blood of Christ. And not only will he pardon the repentant sinner, not only will he permit him to enter heaven, but he, the Father of mercies, will wait at the very gates of heaven to welcome us, to give us an abundant entrance to the mansions of the blessed. Oh, what love, a wondrous, what wondrous love the Father has shown in the gift of his beloved Son for this fallen race. And this sacrifice is a channel for the outflow of his infinite love 
that all who believe on Jesus Christ may, like the prodigal son, receive full and free restoration to the favour of heaven. Friends, don't you want to <laughs> be amongst those who inherit the kingdom of God and enter into heaven with God the Father waiting there to welcome them? Won't that be a, a glorious day? I most certainly want to be there. And before that time comes, God has a work that he desires to work through his people. A work that he is depended upon to bring this great controversy to an end. This work of vindicating his character to the world and silencing every to help silence every single one of Satan's accusations. And he is dependent upon us, his people, to have this work um, wrought and, and brought about and finished. Friends, don't you realize the such the unique privilege and opportunity we have? God is dependent upon us for this. We, we have a privilege that no other generation has of this, this of standing in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, without a safety net, to prove to the universe that God's law is perfectly just in its requirements. God is not requiring the possible the impossible. Every single one of God's requirements is perfectly just. It's perfectly fair. Would you like to be a partaker of that privilege of vindicating God's character to the universe. If you would like to take part in that privilege, please, friends, join me in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for how good and gracious you have been to us, Father, and thank you for this privilege you have given us to vindicate your character to the world, to the whole universe to help bring an end, to, to, help, to help silence every single one of Satan's accusations, Father. Please, Father, draw more and more people to desiring to partake in this work of helping to bring an end to the great controversy. Please, Father, please prepare us for what you have in store for us in the future. Please, fit us to heaven. Help us to desire to feed upon your righteousness. Impart to us your righteousness. Make us to be more and more like you in character, Father. Please help us and give us the boldness to proclaim the three angels' messages to the world, Father. That this world of so much suffering and woe can be brought to an end, to bring an end to that mass amount of suffering taking place that's only going to increase the more time goes on, Father. Please call people to <laughs> desire to be partakers of your righteousness to be a part of the 144,000 and make it possible for you to bring an end to this world. Please, Father, work on people's hearts. Draw people to loving you with all of their hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.